Hello folks, welcome to Between Awesome and Disaster. This is your host, Will Carey. I'm really happy that you're here, and I hope that wherever you are, you are doing well, staying healthy, and, and staying as safe as possible. Um, it is uh, May 19th as of this uh, recording, and uh, we are coming up, uh, I guess we're, I'm at uh, two and a half months of uh, just about of... Uh, of uh, of uh, being remote and uh, and social and uh, and quarantining, staying uh, home. And uh, today I'm feeling I'm feeling pretty good. I have a good sense of where my head is at, and I'm feeling really great. And it is especially having to do uh, with the episode that I have for you today because my guest on the show today is uh, Mitch Allen. Mitch Allen uh, is a Grammy nominated. A songwriter. He's written songs for uh, a, a, um, tons of different people. He's written for Jason Derulo. He's written for Demi Lovato, Hillary, Hillary Duff, Scott Stepp. I know him best, and maybe you do as well, as the lead singer of the rock band SR71, who are, I think, after I discovered uh, Blink-182, uh, SR71 were my second favorite band. And uh, I still uh, love their three their three records. Uh, now you see inside tomorrow, and here we go again. And their music uh, played a, a really important part in my uh, not only my musical education, but in my in the forming of my of my brain. Because that the record now you see inside right now was a, a very big hit, but now you see inside had such incredible songs on it, and to to hear a band from uh, from Baltimore, uh, get that much, uh, have that much success was really inspiring, uh, when I was a teenager. And I just realized, uh, I guess I just thought about it now, but I realized it when, uh, when I was talking to, to Mitch earlier today that, um, it's that, that, re- that record now, you, the debut SR 71 album, uh, came out in 2000. It's now 2020. Uh, I'm 34 now, and I've been a fan of that band since I was 14 years old. So thinking of like pivotal and important music for me, SR71 are like right there with all of the other bands that I was discovering in that pivotal time when I was a teenager. So this was a, a, a dream come true for me. And and I really want to thank uh, Jarrett Reddick from Bowling for Soup for uh, for connecting me with Mitch and Mitch for, for the time. I can't wait to share this uh this interview with you guys if there is there's a lot of great talk about creativity songwriting specifically but i think a lot of what we can ta- uh, talk about can definitely be applied to your creative project and i, I left this feeling uh like i learned something and and feeling really inspired because when i was younger lacking a uh lacking like a a cool a, a cool older male influence the bands i was into became that for me it's changed slightly, but these records still mean a lot. Those those albums I was into in high school still hold a lot of significance for me. So I can't wait to share this with you guys. Um, <laughs> after after this interview, I was giddy with with joy. So I'm 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 ha- I'm really glad that you're here to listen to this. If you are, uh, if you enjoy this interview and you think you know someone else who might be a fan of this podcast as well, I have over 150 episodes for you to enjoy. They are available wherever you get your podcasts. And if you listen to this, I would love to hear from you. Uh, I am pretty available on social media. You can follow me on Twitter at Comic Will Carry. The podcast is at Awesome D Pod on Twitter, and I'm on Instagram at Will Carry Two Three. And uh, I keep it, uh, you know, I doing this podcast helps me stay connected and really in this really weird time that we're living through. And this was an absolute thrill for me. Uh, if 14 year old Will could have could have known that in another 20 years he would have a podcast or be in any kind of situation where he could have a a long interview uh with someone whose music meant so much to him and still does um i think he'd well it definitely would have helped me during that time but i'm i'm very happy that everything that happened in my life has led leads to moments like this so um thank you guys for being a part of that I appreciate all of you, and let's go to my chat with songwriter and SR71 frontman Mitch Allen.
All right. Uh, Mitch Allen, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, you doing my show, man. This is a big deal for me. Well, thanks for having me, man. This is uh, we're together in quarantine. Ex exactly. Uh, we, we are we are together. But even though we are we are separate, this is I wanted to ask you because I, I feel I always want to I've been really feeling like this is my main outlet of connecting with people. How are you how are you faring amidst the state of the world at present, Mitch? I'm, I mean, I'm good. Honestly, if you probably talk to anybody in the music business, at least on the production side, life has changed for us, you know, a little bit, but not all that much because we spend most of our time in a room by ourselves making music, you know, finishing tracks, editing vocals, all those things. So the last two months I've just been working on music. Um, the only difference is I'm not writing as much because people aren't in the room with me. But yeah, life hasn't changed all that much. For the family, of course, they're all cooped up. Uh, in the house and uh, trying to figure it all out. But for me, yeah, it's not so bad. Yeah, I kind of feel the the same way because, you know, my my job is is in the podcasting industry and, you know, I do my own podcast. So I, all I had to do was figure out what cable to get and how to fig work my software and kind of uninterrupted creativity. Um, I, I got a, the one thing I have done is I, I discovered a tune track stuff recently, like Easy Mix and Easy Drummer. So I've been getting oh, that yeah. into a, yeah, I think I've got some settings out there on Easy Mix. Oh, do you? Oh, I need to, I need to get those because I think there's some presets I did maybe a decade ago. I hope they're still available. Oh, I I hope so. I I'm gonna this might I I apologize in advance if this inter, if this invites a, a, a interrupted stream of questions that I might have for you later because, um, and I I might have said this uh, earlier, but like, you were one of my fa you were one of my favorite early like my early on one of my favorite uh, musical artists, Mitch. I remember... Oh, man, that's that's really sweet of you. Thank you. A absolutely, man. I remember, because I'm, I'm from Maryland, too. I grew up in Calvert County, which is about an hour south of Baltimore. I'm not sure if you I know Absolutely, I know Calvert County. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I, w I grew up there, and when I w left to start attending uh, college at Towson University uh, and discovered The Wrecker, and like I think the second show I ever attended was SR seventy one headlining. I think All Time Low were one of the openers. And I remember that show, by the way. That was a great I remember, show. I remember that show because I was blown away by All Time Low. And I was like, Who who are these guys? And then I found that they lived less than a mile from the venue and it kind of blew me away. Now we look back, of course, and they're one of the biggest uh, uh bands. She's one of the biggest touring bands probably in the world. But you know, at the time they were just starting out. They were they were they were kids and they were awesome. We just sat there watching them going, Okay, that's the future right there. Oh, you you really had that moment where you're like, Wow, that that band is gonna be big. Yeah, I was watching them with um with uh John with uh, our drummer, uh my brother our drummer, and we we were just like that that band's gonna be huge. And then the weirdest, most coincidental thing is that the lead singer of all time low married the bass player of sr 71 sister <laughs> oh wow so they're kind of our relatives at this point oh that's that's hilarious um and another way that i'm i'm really connected to your shows from that time um this this is going way back i think this might have been on your on your personal myspace page and not the bands there was a oh my god you just referenced myspace can we take a minute to we can we just take a minute for tom just just a just a second <laughs> Just oh, for, okay, we're I, okay. There we go. I I know. I felt I had that moment. I had that moment earlier. It's like that's going to be like, oh my god, how far have, how far we've come? Uh, kind of moment. There was a, but there was a photo on the on on your MySpace. I think from one of SR's uh, shows at the Wrecker, and you can very clearly see a really tall guy, kind of with an awestruck look on his face and a in a starting line hoodie. That was me. <laughs> okay wow okay i don't uh, uh yeah myspace man that's a distant memory but um that's kind of awesome you made the you made the myspace page i that's great i did and i think um i think it might have been around new year's uh my uh one of my best friend from like elementary school uh i remember you were you had a live recording of uh go away on, on there for a little while and you can sure sure and you can very clearly hear us uh, doing like all the backgrounds, like "Baby, I know." <laughs> I remember. I remember we used to, um, yeah, we were recording everything back then. And I remember we went to, I think we actually did, yeah, I think we did um, the year before we we did. I want you to want me at the nine thirty club, which is actually on 
uh, we released at some point. I don't think we ever put out a, a live version of Go Away, except I think I stuck it on my MySpace page, maybe. That was about it. Yeah, I, I remember that one, uh, that show that show specifically. Um, could the live version of I Want You to Want Me be from the U.S. release of Here We Go Again? Yeah, it, yeah, we put three live tracks, and I think I think uh, the, the, the Cheap Trick cover was recorded in D.C., pretty sure, anyway. Yeah, yeah, 930 Club was, I saw so many great shows there also. I always, I don't know if you feel feel this way, being from, from Maryland, because I started doing comedy in Baltimore, so there was like a very much a distinct Baltimore scene, and there is a distinct D.C. scene. I don't know if sure. you feel the same way about the the music scene, but I feel like in, a, in, in some way it's all kind of, it all kind of blends together at a certain level. Well, you know, the, the scene we came from, late 90s early 2000s is incredibly different than it is now of course right um all the all the, the players all the uh, totally different bands totally different it's about djs it's about punk, really underground punk rock uh hip-hop uh, i would say that back um back when we were playing the clubs i felt like there was definitely a difference and dc was just always a little dirtier you know it was a little mm -hmm. they had the original 930 club and and baltimore had some really big rooms like the 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 930 club now in dc is it's just gorgeous um uh t maybe 2000 seats 2200 there really wasn't a room like that the original 930 club was was tiny maybe 200 and it was it was really a, a, an alternative room and in baltimore we had uh hammerjacks which was yeah, that was that was the big room that was mm -hmm. kind of a, a holdover from the rock days so in the 90s the, all the alternative bands would come through that room and it was it was pretty much a concert hall like a legitimate concert hall so baltimore it was more of a i guess it was more mainstream and then dc was a little more underground but yeah we played all the we played all the clubs around there all the way through northern virginia and everything way before we ever had record deals and it, it was kind of the same the the that whole circuit kind of went up jimmy's chicken check i don't know if you remember them they were I sure they do were, yeah they kind of opened up the door to all those mid-atlantic bands you know without them there wasn't there wasn't really a spotlight on on the Baltimore DC scene until they came out and then people started looking and you know after that we came out of that scene Good Charlotte came out of that scene mm -hmm. um, and and All Time Low obviously came out of that scene but yeah Jimmy's kind of opened the door for all of us yeah I remember hearing the name Jimmy's Chicken Chat but I especially remember and I guess this is like uh, the early two thousands so I was maybe a freshman in high school I remember me and all my friends thinking it was really awesome that a band from Maryland was, was on the radio and, and like I could buy their, and your album was in stores. I remember like thinking, Oh, we're, we're coming up. We're, yeah, we're, we're yeah. on the, we're on the map here in, uh, in the DMV. <laughs> we had been, we had been uh, saying that for years, you know, and, and it's weird because when, when MTV really happened in the nineties and all the rock bands really exploded, Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't really any. There wasn't really a presence until about '96, I guess, when Jimmy's got came out with uh, what was it? Um, uh, High, I think, was the single. Oh, yeah. and it was awesome, and it was so heavy, and it was just it was kind of mind blowing. And all of a sudden, we had like a we had a chip in the big game. And then towards the end of the '90s, a bunch of other bands got signed, and it felt like you know we were we were happening for a minute. You know, the Mid Atlantic was was a breeding ground for a second. Yeah, I I, I remember that time. I, I remember that time so well i wanted to ask you uh because I, I lived in i'd never lived in baltimore city i lived in uh i lived in cockiesville for a few years and i lived in yeah. and i lived in in towson so um when you were when you're growing up what part of baltimore were you in i was in randallstown randallstown where the cisco is our claim to fame nice <laughs> Remember the thong the thong song the thong song and then he tried to follow that up with a very serious sentimental piano ballad and I just don't think you, you, you got to go all in on the thong song kind of songs. Dude. <laughs> well, he was the, he was pretty much the most famous guy at Randallstown. And then um, there was a, a drummer named Dennis Chambers who played with Sting for a long time. Just an amazing drummer. I think he wasn't from Randallstown, but I think he had moved to Randallstown. So those were like our claims, our claims to fame. Mm -hmm. And Randallstown, that's more Baltimore City or, or Baltimore County? It's Baltimore County. So we, my, my family started out in the city. And then right before I, um, I guess, entered grade school, they decided it was safer. And we moved out to the county, stayed there uh, until I graduated high school. And then, yeah, then college down in D.C. And gotcha. And then away, then record deals and then touring the country. Uh huh. And 
I, I wanted to ask you because I, I think uh, when I thought again referencing referencing MySpace, um, you mentioned that you you studied political science. I'm curious if anything you studied in college would explain the state of the world right now. Oh no, Jesus, no, no. I you know it's funny. I I loved politics because um, uh, I guess I didn't understand it all that well. So it was like a, something to conquer. So when you study it in school, it kind of ruins it for you. I also realized I had a really bad problem with names and politicians, you know, they know names, they, they can pick up conversations. They make you feel great about yourself. And mm -hmm. you know, politics was really all about that. It was, it, I, I don't want to say all politicians are liars, but you've definitely got to be a salesman. Um, yeah. And then you, when you start learning how the system works and it, it's kind of fascinating, but then you start thinking about politicians and you realize I think it's something like you have to raise thirty-two thousand dollars a day to stay in Congress, and forty thousand a day to stay in the Senate, and so on. It it becomes about selling yourself and 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 earning money and all these things that I didn't really care about. I was fascinated by by government. I was fascinated by politics, but then I kind of lost my fascination when I realized it was really all about money. So when I look at things today, I don't think it's ever been more apparent that it's really all just about money. Oh yeah, abs absolutely. And I think especially in the in the middle of a uh, quarantine and the in the world shutting down, you're really kind of seeing all of those systems really like stripped bare. Oh, it's crazy. And then we just I think we added two trillion dollars to um to the money supply over the last month. We just conjured two trillion dollars out of thin air. Once you start looking at it like that, I think you just sit back and go, I, I don't know if anybody knows what's really going on or or is really in control of any of it. It just seems a little artificial at this point plus everything that's happening politically and all the all the talking heads and all the, the media and everything it it it's starting to sound like and feel like it just feeds into a system of distraction and i i'd love to know what they're distracting us from but mm -hmm. at the same time it would probably blow my mind and ruin ruin my life if i knew so yeah. I guess we're all staying woefully ignorant of, of what's really happening. Yeah, I kind of feel there are certain things that I'm I'm glad I know, but then there's a lot of stuff that that brings me joy. That I I don't I don't want to know the 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 behind the scenes of uh, of certain things like the way like certain like the way certain like songs or guitarists make me sound. I I don't want to hear the di tracks or I don't want to hear what it sounds like without all the the bells and whistles. Just... All the editing. No, that's part of the fun. I mean, honestly, if you do this for a living, you hear what it sounds like, you know, before and after. And there's a lot of stuff. Like to me, the, the purity of a performance is still the greatest thing in the world. I know we kind of just took a left turn, but yeah, I can edit anything and make it sound perfect, but perfect is boring. And that goes for just about everything in life. You know, if you take the character out of something that makes it individual, it just becomes boring. Like right now, politics has never been more exciting. That's for sure. But oh, it's the same yeah. thing with a pure performance. The, the the things that make it imperfect are the things that we end up falling in love with. Exactly, and so uh, kind of on on that vein, I'm I'm curious. Uh, so when you're when you were growing up in in Randallstown, and getting exposed to music for the first time, what were some of the bands and and records that were like really blowing your mind? Like, do you have a moment uh, or a record that you go to and like that's the record that set my path in this life? Well, I mean, it's probably a generic answer, but the Beatles kind of started everything for me. Um, mm -hmm. My dad was a huge Beatles fan. And he turned me on to them. It really wasn't about listening to the radio. It was about listening to my father's records. He came up, the Beatles were his band. So that's the first thing he turned me on to. And then post Beatles stuff like, you know, Imagine, John Lennon and, and, and Band on the Run, uh, Paul McCartney. And he just submerged, he submerged me in that type of music. So I always loved power pop. Uh -huh. And then as I found my own music, you know, leaving that's kind of an ecosystem unto itself. And then as that branches out, which kind of touches everything and everybody, I discovered the, the, the melodic rock that I loved, which turned out to be like the sex pistols and the Ramones and ACDC early ACDC with Bon Scott and a, yeah. a lot of bands that weren't, you know, these were all bands that had, had come and gone, but had left such a footprint and they were there to discover. And I kind of discovered them with my friends and it all kind of sounded, you know, the a very aggressive, Beatles was what it all sounded like to me. You know, it all it all stemmed from the same place. So what, by the time I finally picked up a guitar and started playing, that's the kind of stuff I started writing. I wouldn't say that it, it was in the league of any of those bands, but I, I thought that's what I was doing. So for me, they started it all. But I don't think it really was until Green Day, Nirvana, and 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 the bands of the early '90s when mm -hmm. it happened. All of a sudden, all of that aggression and all of that melody all wrapped up into one and music really made sense to me. That's when I started really playing in bands and 
trying to write songs because it all it all made sense yeah that that makes total sense to me especially like because when you think of all those bands the beatles you you can learn that the that catalog is like a songbook for how to write is like a textbook for how to oh my write God. incredible songs. How do you songs. use the same progression a thousand times and write a thousand different songs? Exact, exactly. And like deconstructing, like you can learn, you can learn like major and minor scales through these songs and yeah. like, or all of this, all of the tools are are in that catalog. And I always related to, to ACDC because um, I grew up like a, a you know, a, 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 sub a suburban uh, punker. Uh, so my introduction to like, rock music uh that really got me excited like oh what is that was enema the stamp by blink by blink 182 and then sure great I, record and that changed everything you know uh, when that record came out oh it's such an am amazing record and then to go and like this is back when vh1 would play like behind the music and like all of the at the time what was considered like the dad rock or classic rock at the time and acdc to me was like a more rock and roll the template of a rock and roll version of a of a punk rock band because it's a lot of right. big open chords and played in a really aggressive way like really breaking down well, like listening to isolated malcolm young rhythm tracks he's a he's an amazing guitar player he he plays very minimal but what he what he plays is pretty incredible yeah i i really just digging into the subtleties of of that i find really awesome and well, the thing about ACDC is a lot of people don't realize there's really two ACDCs. You know, there's pre Brian Johnson. You know, there's their 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 early stuff sounded like punk rock to me. Bon Scott, the original singer, sounded like he was he was a he was just an old school punk, screaming and uh -huh. he had melody, and he was just crazy good. Brian Johnson, when when he joined the band, I feel like they really became much more of a rock traditional rock band. Also, rock got really big, so maybe that 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 influenced them. But the stuff I was really in love with was that super fast, you know, rock like songs like Rocker, which sounded like the Sex Pistols to me. I didn't know the difference. I was too young to really know. But the the guy screaming in the microphone, you know, let there be rock. That to me was it was punk rock. I did I didn't really know the difference. And then later on, of course, they became the biggest band in the world with those "You Shook Me All Night Long" and, and mm -hmm. songs like that. Well, that that was like a different. A different sound to me that was a different type of acdc but you know obviously they sold what 150 million records so they yeah. got it right yeah so something something cra crazy like that and then the and 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 now that brian brian's out and then you the guy you wrote a song about he's he's in the band now which is surreal of oh, Ax to, axel rose to, to think uh, about like that i yeah. don't think they're are they still touring with axel I, they, they were that's for, done right they, they i don't even for, know at this point I, I don't I have I have no idea to be to be perfectly honest and and so when you were a, a teenager like were you going to shows in in Baltimore I'm I'm so curious what the Baltimore music scene was like during this time. So yeah, uh, it's funny because it's a lot of flashes. I don't remember a whole hell of a lot from that time period. Um, there used to be a, a little bar on Utah Street downtown called the Loft, which was pretty much the punk room. And on Sunday nights, you know, it was all ages and it was kind of crazy and. Uh, there, there were um, amazing shows that happened at that room. Some of them were absolutely terrifying because the, the crowd was so, it was a very, what's the word, aggressive crowd. So I went a bunch of times with my friends. Somebody always got hurt. You know, it was one of those kind of rooms. It was basically a right. room where they had let a bunch of guys in with spray paint uh, uh, and just graffiti the shit out of it. They built a stage on one side. It had like half a PA and it was just lo the loudest place you'd ever been to. Uh -huh. That place went out of business at some point and moved to another location. And we went there a bunch of times. And these were just these were just bands, a lot, a lot of local bands, a lot of bands that, that came touring through Baltimore on these low budget tours. But, you know, there'd be 12 bands on the bill. You'd get there at, I don't know, noon and you'd uh -huh. stay until 930 at night. You were just a sweaty mess you know if you weren't dragged into the pit and, and stomped on you, you you could walk out without a bloody nose so the, <laughs> the 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 other side of the scene was the bigger rooms the really the the, the big bands would always come down like I, we spoke earlier about that bar called hammerjacks well on sunday nights they had their their all ages shows and it was everybody on mtv would come through uh these i thought they were way too big you know to play the room um but they would play and uh uh they'd sell out and it was incredible because you were right there. You were right on top of them. You know, it's always a good place to see a show. 
And then later on, when I became, uh, when I was in a band, we'd start opening up for some of the bigger bands. You know, they always put a local band on mm -hmm. in, in front, maybe to help out the draw or maybe just because they didn't want to, they didn't want to pay us. So yeah, we saw, we saw a ton of, a ton of acts and, and Baltimore had some bands that, uh, I thought were really big. It turns out, you know, as time went on, you realize they were just a re regional bands, you know, they would play up and down the East coast, mm -hmm. but to us, we were just kids. So we thought they were just as big as as uh or as kiss or acdc you know we didn't we didn't really know until we got a little bit older and like oh yeah okay you you play the smaller rooms but we you know we saw everybody back then oh that's that sounds like like such an incredible time i i know exactly what you mean though like the seeing like seeing laughing colors open for shine down at the record laughing colors yeah. oh my god amazing yeah, Man, what, a, what, what a reference. Anybody outside of Baltimore that's listening to this is going, who, who the fuck is Laughing Colors? Well, well, it, shout out to Dave Chief. Yes, I, I'm face, I'm Facebook friends with him. He's he's still doing he's doing great from uh, from the looks of he's it. He's a great dude, man. I've been friends with those guys forever since mid nineties. Um, and I made a solo record for Dave, God, over a decade ago. Oh, that's that's awesome, and. Yeah. And and so and and how old were you when you started playing in bands? Because you were in a band before uh, SR seventy one, yes. Well, the first, I mean, the first group I was ever in, I was in high school. Like most people, you picked up a guitar and you just started mm -hmm. jamming with with guys. And we'd rehearse, uh, we'd rehearse after school in my parents' basement. And eventually, we played a couple of shows, nothing big. And then um, when I got to college, I started a band, and that band uh, pretty much morphed into SR seventy one, but it morphed into it over a, a long period of time, like six years, and a lot of different players. Um, and we we actually got when when we finally signed with RCA. We had just changed our name from Honor Among Thieves to Radio Star. We changed our name because we were like, okay, we're, we, we've been doing this a long time. Mm -hmm. No one in New York is going to care about us because they've heard the name way too much. So we changed the name, made, a, made an EP. Everyone loved it. We signed RCA, and then we, we hated the name. So we, we, we were thinking, okay, well, it's an interim name. Now, now we need a name. So that's when we, we renamed the band SR71. Uh, and awesome and and so this is like you you so you you make this ep and then you get signed to rca and like probably in like the late 90s yeah we signed in 99 i think actually mm -hmm. yeah very end of the 90s and then we we went away for a year and made a record came out the first single i know came out it's may right now so it came out 20 years ago this month Wow, it's so, it's so so crazy to think about that because I was listening to, um, because all my all my CDs are are in different uh, are in different places, but I I had to to finally get Spotify because uh, for to make playlists for my my wedding coming up, and I was like, oh. hey, congratulations, man! Oh, thank you, man! And You're I, welcome. And I, and I was and I was going through and and I was like, oh wait. I could I could listen to I don't have to try to find out where my copies of Now You See Inside Tomorrow and Tomorrow are I I, ha, I have them here now, and those those that out al those albums to me still hold up Now You See Inside that record meant meant so much to me man because and I don't know if you would agree with this characterization I always felt like some people called SR seventy one a rock band some and but I feel like maybe because of right now you you guys would often get lumped in with like pop punk bands mm -hmm. we called ourselves a rock band we never really we never considered ourselves punk rock at all i i i loved punk and i loved like pop punk but the band itself was definitely a rock band you know because of the players that make up the band um right now is definitely a, a pop punk pop punk type of song but we we considered ourselves like in the mold of a band like cheap trick where those guys in the 70s, which, you know, 25 years before, they kind of walked the same line we did where they were a rock band and some of their songs were super punk and other their songs were were, were much more emotional and, and, and down tempo. So mm -hmm. they kind of walked all over those lines and we did the same thing. The, the, excuse me, the biggest problem with that, of course, is then people don't know how to classify you. You know, you put out a record. And if you're lucky, you get a single that goes on the radio and everybody knows you from that one song. So whatever that one song is, everyone says, well, you're a pop punk band because I heard that song. Well, if you listen to the whole record, you'd probably say you're you're a rock band. But yeah. I get it. I totally understand people have the need to classify things. And we definitely got classified into that category based on the single. But as our career unfolded, I think most people just realized we were just a rock band, you know. 
Yeah, that's kind of uh, how I viewed uh, Now You See Inside. It was like a, just a really great uh, rock or power pop. Maybe maybe I would uh, classify it as a power pop record, but definitely like, definitely power pop. But but by the time we came out, power pop people didn't look at it and go, "Oh, I can't wait the next the newest power pop record." Nobody nobody was talking about power pop by the, by, back in the early two thousands. Exactly, it doesn't have the kind of fanaticism that like punk or or, or metal does, but like like songs but like um what a mess or or last man on the, on the the moon bangers dude not the like not the Thanks, fastest man. song but I, I loved i still love those songs man. again that that showed the record that me and my my best friend from elementary school chris went to we were just like screaming and wicked like sound sound <laughs> that when when you when you think about so, ban, bands and songs that are like the soundtracks of parts of your life that is what the that record was so i was I was all about I was all about it, man. And so wow, I really appreciate it, man. I mean, those were the those were the angsty songs. Most of those songs were just written about how much I hated myself and and trying to make fun of that and and somehow relate it in a in a way where it didn't seem like I was feeling sorry for myself. So when I would write those songs from from that point of view, I figured, well, everybody has to feel this way. I can't be the only one. So when I started writing songs like What a Mess, I feel like everybody thinks they're a mess, you know? And songs like Last May on the Moon was literally a song because my parents thought I was lazy because I never got out of bed before noon. But the truth was, I lived the same life as everybody. It just started later in the day. I get up at noon and then I would mm -hmm. go to bed at four o'clock in the morning. Same, you're awake the same amount of time. But to say it in a way where it was a little self-deprecating and humorous, that was kind of the goal. And and that that to me what was what that record was. It was a chance to be emotional without taking myself too seriously. Absolutely. I have one question about one song on that record, and then I'd love to ask about um, your experiences on the road during that time. Uh, this, sure. The the closer, Paul McCartney, I would, I've listened to that, and I still can't quite figure out exactly uh, <laughs> what it what it's about. But it's a, a great it's a great song. Thank you. It's a great song that you don't have no idea what it's about. <laughs> Wh which I maybe uh, nobody that's what knows I'm what it's about. Uh, I think I was probably the only person because it, the lyrics are so vague. They're so vague. Um, I I wrote that song uh, probably three o'clock in the morning um, in a in a soundproof windowless room in Baltimore, and I was discovering those chords for the first time, and mm -hmm. so the melodies just kind of poured out of me, and in my head it sounded like a be very Beatlesque progression. Mm -hmm. And so when I started to write the lyrics, there's a lot of stream of consciousness in there, and it was just about how life has taken me down this road. Here's the road that life has taken me down. And this is where I am in it. But there's a lot of different roads that could have taken me down. And I'd be on a completely different road um, if Paul McCartney had not died. And now what I mean by that is if anybody knows anything about the Beatles, there was mm -hmm. this ridiculous. Uh, Paul is dead. Uh, yeah. Paul is dead. That uh, thing that conspiracy that, just it's gone on for the last 50 years where Paul McCartney was killed in 1967 at three o'clock in the morning, driving a car uh, with some girl named Rita. And then they, they substituted him with a guy named uh, Billy, not Billy Sheen, but Billy something else. I can't remember, but he was an imposter. And so McCartney died in 67. He was replaced. And that's the guy that's been, was on all the rest of the Beatle records. And that's the guy that's still alive today. And it's this amazing drug conspiracy that I don't think any of us think is true now. But when I was a kid, I I was totally looking for the clues in the records. So when I wrote uh -huh. that song, I was thinking, okay, uh, it's like that movie Sliding Doors. There's, there's all these timelines that are running at the same time. And the timeline that I'm on right now and where I am in my life, this is this moment. But if Paul McCartney hadn't died in 1967, I'd be in a completely different place because I never would have discovered the Beatles and I never would have ended up here. I'd be all the way over here. Uh -huh. So in a very strange, ridiculous way, that song is me saying, well, this is who I am and this is where I am. But it would all be different if this one event had not happened way back when. That's awesome, man. The, the, uh, it, it always gave me <laughs> I this must kind have of... Been, I must have been high when I wrote it. That's <laughs> all I can say. Well, it, it that song, it always kind of gave me this like really this feeling like even if I didn't really know exactly where you were coming from it, it just I knew how it made me feel and that's why it, it made it special to me and I was curious did you guys did did SR tour a lot before the the record deal and but I know, I know you said you toured like uh, Maryland and, and Virginia yeah. 
Um, so well, then we the did. We we started touring in like '96. I think we bought a like a 12 passenger Dodge van and we had like a little trailer for all of our gear. And we just started going up and down the East Coast. Um, we had a booking agent who I, I wanted to do it full time because uh, I figured the more we played, the better we would get. And it, it's it's a difficult proposition to to tour enough to make enough money to to survive. So right. We started out in 96. We we put out uh, this EP it was, you know, straight out of school, really. And and we played probably I, I had an acoustic gig in, in downtown Baltimore. And so we would basically go out on the road and play three or four nights a week. And then I would come home and I would play um, acoustic down in Fells Point. And mm -hmm. as people started coming and see that gig, I would add members of the band until it was finally a weekly gig for the band. And then we had weekly gigs uh, in, in other towns. So I think we built up maybe for two, three years until we were playing five nights a week. And then we decided we weren't getting anywhere because we were playing so much, we weren't writing the right songs. Mm -hmm. So we just stopped. We were like, okay, we're done. We're going to lock ourselves into this studio and we're going to write. We're going to write the songs that are going to change our lives. And that was pretty much the beginning of Now You See Inside. Awesome. And then did and then after that record comes out, it does it does well. Do you start touring like the country, the world? Uh, I'm I'm, I'm yeah. curious about that. The world, man. It's like that that that, that movie Spinal Tap. You know, we went from playing up and down the the East Coast to playing the whole country. To suddenly, we were flying around the world. That was crazy. That, Looking that, back on it, it just happened so fast. You know. Oh, that that's so cool. I've I've heard and I, I I'm from seeing comments on YouTube and and maybe from knowing some of the story of your your third record that you have some some fans in japan i'm curious um where did you how far did you play did you guys play like all through asia we well we went to japan we did okinawa um and then we kind of skipped korea china there wasn't a lot going on in china back then um mm -hmm. we could have played in korea but i'm not sure what happened we were going to book a tour and it never happened we, we never went to vietnam either or anything in, in Indonesia. We never went to Jakarta or anything. Mm -hmm. Kind of skipped all that and stayed in Europe. So we kind of kind of bounced around through whatever the biggest markets were back then. Now I think it's all it's all different, but a lot of Europe and then Japan and you, you know mostly North America. A lot of Canada. Mm -hmm. And and but it, it, I wish we would have gone to South America. That's a place that I really regret that we never got a chance to tour. Oh my gosh, yeah. I've seen some of these like South American shows with like when bands finally play down there, like and ridiculous. Just these crazy, crazy huge huge venues. The, 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 I think those people, uh, uh, the, the people that live in South America, they love music. Music is such a huge part of their lives and because they don't, they're not like the first stop on the road, mm -hmm. they built up such an affection for all of their favorite bands that by the time they get there, they know every word, every song, every every show that I've ever seen. Like uh, ACDC put out a concert film. Uh, I don't remember if it was... Oh, River Plate. Yes, the, the soccer okay, you know stadium. What I'm talking about. It's like 150,000 people in a stadium or something ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. It, they they sold out the, the, the football stadium, uh, I think, <sighs> down there. The cameras were shaking when the crowd was jumping up and down. It was that many people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So stuff like that, like I always saw those shows and I always thought, man, I really want to go down there. You know, it looks like it just looks like it's out of this world, but we never got the chance. Yeah, man, I, I, I've done, I've done one, I, I've done comedy in Chile and, and I still need to get a few other places, but yeah, I, I would, I know exactly what you mean. It just looks like such an incredible, passionate, like fan, fan culture, you know? Yeah, man. Yeah. That's, that's. Japan was like that. Japan was definitely uh, mind blowing. We, we went there, um. Uh, they warned us, you know, the, the record company was like, it's not like playing in the United States. We had no idea what that meant. And then you get there and you're like, Oh my God, this is what, this is what actual, this is what fans are like. You mm -hmm. know, they, they were, they were going crazy. Amazing place to play. Japan is, is one of my all time, you know, it's funny. We played probably five, six cities over there and I, I it was never a bad show. Yeah. I, my, my goal for my band now, when we're uh, allowed to tour again, uh, is to get us famous in Japan. That's that's my that's my, <laughs> Good my luck, main man. Goal. A lot of competition these days. I I you know? know. I've talked to uh I've talked to a, f a few people. Like I, I I interviewed like Tim from from Alistair, and they're still pretty popular in in Japan. And the way they describe the shows and the way you just uh, described the shows to me just sounds like the most incredible experience. So, th so much fun. You just you, you got to leave it all out there because the, the audience has given you everything. You know, you feel, you feel, I've never felt so invigorated. And the, 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 the weird part was, is uh, the light shows over there, they're tremendous, they're huge. The heat that's on stage, you would think you'd pass out, it's so hot, but you 
the audience is giving you everything. So you just, you're giving it right back to them. Oh yeah. I've seen tons of like big stadium shows where uh, like the crowd all has like two of those like glow sticks that look like the things that air traffic uh, controllers use to drive planes. And the entire crowd is in sync moving at the same time to the rhythm of the music. It's amazing. Just, Mm -hmm. just those kind of like powerful moments that are great when you get bogged down in like, Oh, why does this video have so many million views? This song is so much better. That kind of, that kind of stuff that I'm prone to on occasion. Um, so, so you, you tore, you tore off of now you see inside. And I'm, I was always, uh, curious when you go into record tomorrow, uh, which is a, a heavier sounding record than from the first one. Although some people ca- categorize it as new metal, which I always found bizarre. Um, I was curious, um, was there a con was, did you have the conscious thought to, to write heavier songs going into that album or was that just kind of where you were at? at the time it's just where i was just depressed coming coming off of the first record that we had we'd been on the road for about 18 months and mm-hmm. uh i was losing my voice because we we just never stopped playing i was getting sick all the time and the songs took a dark turn because i was in a dark place um but some of the songs that we had written before we got uh our deal were very much in that vein they were very dark and mm-hmm. we uh, we always got comments from people when we were trying to uh you know shop our first record deal that our stuff was, we were too, it was too dark. You know, it wasn't, you, know, you need, you, you, the song's got to be brighter. The songs have to be a little bit more commercial appeal. Sure. I think we kind of reverted back to things we were doing before we put out our first record. Um, compounded with, we kind of, we kind of knew where we were in the world and we were, we were, we were writing better songs. So we just wrote a darker record. Uh, I kind of wish, you know, looking back, there's a couple songs that on that record that weren't dark at all. That were super fun. Uh, like she was dead. Yeah, that's um, a that's a super fun song. I think a Lucky is a really fun song also. Lucky is another one. I wish I would have uh, you know surrounded that record with a couple more of those because everybody wouldn't have asked you, "Okay, man, you all right? Yeah. Everything okay?" <laughs> People got concerned. I was like, "Everything's fine. It's good." I, but yeah, uh, it, we were just that was just where we were. You know, and some things had happened in, in while we were making that record that uh, a lot of people don't know. Mm-hmm. Um our ba- our bass player Jeff, um he got very sick. Right. That kind of that. that kind of took on a very um a very serious nature. You know, we were we were we were a lot of fun on the road. We had a great time and and when he got sick it really put things in perspective. You know, when you're you're a kid, you're out touring, you're making music and then you find out that this guy who's basically your brother and has been for years um has has a a, a pretty serious illness. It really mm-hmm. shakes you to your core. You don't you're not going to think the same way. You're not going to be writing very carefree. That kind of took over a little bit for for us mm-hmm. during the writing process. I mean, during the recording process. Um, yeah, I mean, some things you can't help. You know, life is just going to happen. I can only imagine what it would be like to be in Def Leppard uh, while you're trying to make uh, what was the big record? Hysteria, the drummer. Yeah, Hysteria gets it right, and the guitar player passes away. I mean, it's just so much negativity. So, in, in going through something like that, yeah, you, you're not impervious to it when you're trying to write music. Yeah, that I can I can relate to this to this dynamic. This happens. Uh, I don't know how much stand up comedy you consume, but there is uh, there's definitely a camp of of comedy that's very silly, lighthearted, like going for lots of laughs kind of jokes. And then uh, there's a f- the the more like long form storytelling, like more personal kind of shows that are are po- that are starting to get popular now that you would see it like sure you'd see it like the Edinburgh fringe festival. And I, I definitely know I have those two sides at war at war within myself. There's the guy who wants to say, you know, I don't mean to piss you off with the things you might say, but kind of, kind of comedy. And then there's like, I'm going through some stuff, man. I need you to see me. Right. Right. I mean, that's kind of when you're, when you're a musician and you can put 11 songs on a record, you don't want to repeat yourself 11 times. You want to give 11 instances of what you're feeling and, our second album, there was definitely more darker songs than there were brighter songs, but there were brighter songs, but the record company wanted to put out the darker ones. So all mm-hmm. of a sudden we were the, we were the mopey emo band. <laughs> I, I would, if it, if it makes you feel any better, I would never put you in the same category as uh, like the get up kids or Jim or no. Jimmy world or mineral. Although that would be an amazing show. Like if you guys wanted to reunite and tour with them, that would, I would, spend so much money to go to that i oh, um, appreciate it man i just saw jimmy world last year oh yeah um they opened up for third eye blind in los angeles at um where were we uh the greek maybe mm-hmm. it was awesome 
Oh, that sounds like a great show. I saw them a few years ago uh, in Central Park. It was the album. I think it was like two albums before their most recent one. And it was an incredible show. It was it was so much fun. I'm trying to they think. were great. They were great back in the day. We, we toured with them probably 2002, maybe. Oh, awesome. 2003, somewhere around there. They were amazing. N- nicest guys. Yeah, I've heard they're incredibly nice guys. Most of the most of the music people I've I've talked to and in comedians as well are just like the chillest, like most laid back people. I, I it's really kind of great to have those moments when like your heroes are, are cool also. And I'll include this interview in that as well. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Um, uh, I also wanted I wanted to ask you a guitar related question. Do you still do you still have or, or play that uh that Les Paul that has the SR seventy one logo on it? It's in the studio in the house, about a hundred yards away from me right now. That's that's aw- that's awesome. Do you still uh are, do you still favor uh because I I saw videos where you w- you would kind of alternate between playing Les Pauls uh Paul Reed Smith of course because we're from Maryland. Got to right. got to have a Paul Reed Smith, and I saw you play a Telecaster. I think on on the Tonight Show. Uh, I'm curious what you're playing nowadays. Um, you know, it, it, I love Tellys. Tellys are super fun. Um, they work a little bit better in pop music uh, than Les Pauls do these days, just because it's a it 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 fits in better. It's not as big, fat, thick mid range instrument, so you can kind of carve it around uh, uh, pop songs a little bit more, but. If I had to tell you what my favorite guitar is, it's probably my 335, which is mm-hmm. just an all around great sounding guitar. It's it, it it's more of like that's what I write songs on because it sounds so good, whether it ends up in the final mix or that's the song, you know, at the end of the day, that's that's the guitar that you're listening to in the song. I, I don't even know because things change so much, but that's probably my favorite guitar to play. Yeah, those those sound sound amazing. I guess that kind of makes that that sort of makes sense to me, because when I think about the guitar that's in 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 pop songs uh, today, uh, I think the telly is is, and maybe this is just the the algorithm on YouTube telling me this, but it seems like the telly is like favored by like the uh, the cool kids nowadays. <laughs> well, it's always, I mean, it's just a beast of an instrument. But tellys and strats kind of occupy uh, like a true pop song. They're just there's something about them that they, they occupy a much smaller space and that allows for you know louder vocals bigger drums and you can still hear the guitar when when sr was making uh, our records it was really all about guitar sounds the bigger the sound the better and les paul's pretty much the, the biggest just badass tones uh you know my paul reed smith my paul reed smith is more, is, is very uh, um it's been operated on a couple of times it's a that's a just a great sounding always stays in tune rock guitar you know yeah but if I'm not doing a, a rock song, eh, sometimes sometimes I just stick to a telly and just do the whole the whole thing. I've got like three different tellies, which I love. One's a soap bar telly, one's a Texas two hand telly, and then one's a uh, it's just a traditional U.S. made telly. Nice, yeah. I I've I've been thinking about what my my next guitar will be. I I've been part of the way I've been passing time in quarantine is Fender has a, a mod shop section where you can kind of customize strat, strats and telecasters. And I've always, I, I look at, you know, putting like those two, two humbuckers in it and getting that like tele custom look. And, and then yeah, and you gotta then, go to vintage shops, man. Yeah. You gotta, don't buy it new. Don't buy it new. Go buy a vintage guitar. All right. The wood. You need old wood. Old you know, wood. If you buy a new, if you buy a new guitar, you got to age it. You got to figure out how to make it sound like an old guitar gotcha like put it in like some barometric chamber you know to kind something of... <laughs> like that there's actually some product I, I can't remember what it was steven from third eye blind was telling me about this this thing that some got somebody made where you put it on your guitar and you put it back in the case and you leave it for like a year and it ages your guitar like 18 years a year or something like that and so it turns it turns new guitars into vintage guitars i have no idea if it works or not i just I just know that's a thing. It it's it sounds cool. My my main the main guitar uh, I, I the main gr- guitar I'm recording stuff right now is uh, an Epiphone Les Paul custom I've had since since high school and Epiphones are dope and they they make some great stuff now. Yeah, they, they, I I think it it plays it plays great. I got it fixed up. It's it sounds like really nice and th- and and thick and like when you know again doing those like big ACDC kind of open chords and and power chords sure. and. And every t- and when it comes to basses, every time I've tried to play a, a bass that's not a Fender Precision, I'm always wish I was playing a Fender Precision or a, a jazz. Yeah, dude, P P bass is where it's at still. Yeah, I I think I mean Fender they nailed it in the '50s and they haven't had to change it uh, too much. 
Um, I also wanted I wanted to to, to ask you. So so the second the second record comes out, and then your third record only comes out only gets released in Japan. And I was and I know around this time your career transitioned to more of a behind the scenes scenes role. I was I was wondering if you could kind of take me through that time and what that transition looked like. Well, we we were part of. Um a cleaning house at RCA along with a lot of other bands uh, where basically yeah. we're in the middle of supporting our second record. And the, the president of the label kind of happens every five years, he gets fired and uh -huh. then all the whole staff uh, gets fired. And then they basically dropped maybe 90% of the bands. We were in that, that sweep. And at the time we were about halfway done writing what was going to be our third record. Mm -hmm. So John and I, just decided okay let's just let's go buy a bunch of gear finish our studio and just go record it ourselves mm -hmm. and we were being managed by jonathan daniel at the time uh crush management so i sent the record to jonathan we were done he's like oh my god this, this is great it's the best thing you've ever done um i really lo i love this let's go get a deal so at that time there were a lot of bands that were classified as pop punk bands that were being dropped and let go from their labels we're talking 2004 and 5 mm -hmm. mid mid 2000s and even though we we knew we were a rock band, you know, you have that stamp on you, pop punk, right. and it became very difficult. So Jonathan, um, he was managing, he well still does manages Butch Walker, who was in the studio with Bowling for Soup at the time, and we uh, we we had obviously we had 1985 was was one of the songs on the record, but right. it wasn't a single for us. It was just a, a fun little song, and it really didn't fit with our band very well. It was it was one of those songs where we we. We, we wrote it and it was on the record, but Jonathan heard it and he said, this is, this is a Bowling for Soup song. You need to send this to Jared um, and see what he thinks. So I sent him the record and he calls me and he's like, I, f I fucking love this, man. Uh, can, I, um, can I work with this? And I said, yeah, just you know, rewrite it the way that, that you want to rewrite it. So he took the record, um, came in as a writer, totally took out all the cynical, ridiculous stuff that, that we had kind of put in it, you know, SR, when, when I wrote lyrics for, for us, I kind of always pushed to the, to the silly side, a little bit more ridiculous and cynical, mm -hmm. a little, a little darker. And, um, when Jared came in and, and rewrote what he needed to uh, rewrite, which was a really good, significant portion of the song, it, it really, it made that song come to life. And all of a sudden we heard it and we were like, Oh my God, that sounds like a, that sounds like a hit record and they put it out and that record just i i see this is what i remember i remember they cut it on like a monday finished it on a wednesday mixed it by friday tested the record the next week and it came back just through the roof and then it came out before i know it and it was number one most added and it just became so big so fast mm -hmm. and and i mean just watching those guys promote it, the video they made uh, and everything, sitting on the sidelines watching and going, this is incredible. Like this would have, it, it kind of blew my mind because even though I was uh, a, a big part of that record, I watched I watched the artist take it and make it a massive hit. And that's when I realized, oh my God, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be mm -hmm. you know, writing songs with um, with artists and, and and letting them go out and, and working the records and turning them into big, hit records you know when when they when they fit there's nothing like it in the world when it's the right record right song right band it, it just works and there's no other way to say it mm -hmm. so when when we when we um made that record and we we didn't get a deal uh and best decision i ever made was you know bringing jared in uh to rewrite 1985 we ended up at the time we were kind of out of money so jonathan said well we can do a licensing deal in japan while we're waiting to figure out what we're doing. So that's what we did. That's why the record came out when it did in Japan only. Mm -hmm. So once, once Bowling for Soup took 1985 uh, to, to the top, I mean, I think it was a uh, no, number one in a bunch of formats, but definitely a top five record at, at top 40. Yeah. I knew right then and there, the, this is, this is my calling. Um, and that record changed my life. You know, I, I, I can't, I can't say enough about what it's like to be, to have friends that, that I wouldn't say, I mean, you could call it a favor, but not favors because we're all mu mutually benefiting from it. But for me, not knowing what my future was mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Jared coming in and rewriting that song and Butch producing that song, 
you know, these were my friends for, for, for five or six years that I'd been touring with. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden I felt like I was a part of this community and I had a, a clear path, which was going to be, I'm going to write songs and I'm going to produce songs for other people. And, and this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So it was, a, it was a, it was a life changing, amazing moment for me. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. And that, that song, that song is great. And yeah, I think that song was like, it set a record for like most downloads on iTunes in a week or, or something oh, yeah. crazy like that. Dude, when it came out, it, it was I, there was nothing to prepare me. I seem like I'm at a loss for words. There was nothing to prepare me for the success that that record had. And, you know, I didn't know. I had no clue. And I watched uh, the people who did have a clue, you know, like, um, well, Jared's a great example. He knew his audience. He knew the record. As soon as he heard it, he's like, I think, I think this is going to be a big one. Um, Jive Records, the record company he was uh, mm -hmm. on, the way they promoted it, just everything. It was like everything you could do right uh, happened and and all of a sudden my phone started ringing hey can you write with this person do you want to write with this person and it, it was one of those seamless transitions based on that gift of a song that's that's really incredible man and and the, yeah and then to have this incredible like um i'm, I'm not going to call it a second act because i don't think you ever like you, there's no like behind the behind the music like oh and he almost destroyed it destroyed his life but to have this kind of like <laughs> amazing continuation of your career where you're still able to be creative and and do the the and do the thing you love maybe and the evolution of the dream this is something i, I think about a, a lot in my in my 30s now it's incredible just continuing to do the thing i think is is one of the the coolest things and i was when i was going through doing some research going going through my written by Mitch Allen playlist uh the, the sheer volume and 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 diversity of songs that you have credits on is really is really fascinating like i listened to those songs that um you did with for Scott Stapp's solo album and it was like oh my god the, oh my god those could those could have been <laughs> to me they were like this could th these could be like on these could have been cut from tomorrow they're like so melodic and 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 impactful and and again that kind of like dark that that sort of like dark quality of of that record that i love so much i and, appreciate it man and then I, I i dude i love writing songs and to me a song a song is a song and then you can produce it to be a uh, hundred different ways a hundred different genres i i think my writing is pretty consistent for as long as i've been doing this but production is the thing that changes so you look at like like you said the scott stapp stuff and 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 some of the stuff that i did with uh with uh, daughtry back in the day mm -hmm. those are just great pop songs and th those guys singing of course makes them a lot more uh rock and roll and a lot more just just bigger those those voices they're just giant voices especially especially chris chris daughtry what a voice man oh yeah he has such an again that sort of like melodic like early 2000s like 90 well, i call it like 98 rock style kind of rock voice he he hits <laughs> again the the baltimore reference i love it <laughs> i i have got so many because this is quarantine has given me the opportunity to like reach out to like comedian friends of mine and people friend and like and people i really look up to like you that are from baltimore so i know there's some people that would really appreciate this and i'm i'm curious when you're writing songs with like with like pop stars or like r b singers like that uh jason derill song <laughs> Did you have to like come learn different ways of playing guitar? Did you have to learn like how to play guitar like for R and B or for, or for different pop styles, or do you write it like the way you write, and then it gets transformed into something else? Well, I don't. I never looked at any of those records and thought like that's that's an R and B guitar player. You know, that's 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 a rock guitar player. I think you just play the way you play. Um, with "Want to Want Me," when. Um, Ian Kirkpatrick, who produced that record, when he put those drums up, you're just you're dancing, you know. You're not you're not thinking, you know, how can I make how can I make this really heavy, um, you know. And I was the guy holding an acoustic that day, so I was just playing with the drum track that he was kind of building at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, you know, we wrote that song. Obviously, the the people that wrote that song, I don't think there was any anybody that I would consider an R and B head in the room. You know, pretty much just pop people. But the, the, the record instantly is going to take on that feel um, because that, that's what the program and that's what the drums were playing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that, that, that's a testament to Ian because he really, and that track is awesome. That track oh. is, I still listen to that track and I'm like, man, this is so good. It's so good. You cannot not dance to that song. That's how good nah, that's. It makes so. you happy. That record still makes me happy when I hear it. Oh, yeah. It, it, like, and I, 
And when I was going through this, I was like, Mitch Allen has a credit on this. That's man. I can't wait to ask him about that song. Cause I remember hearing that on the radio and just, again, I, I can't, I don't dance. I wouldn't even consider myself really a, a pop music savvy person nowadays, but I was just so, so into it, man. It was, it was great. Um, so, uh, something else I, I was curious about is there, what is something that you learned, uh, from working with other artists or working with other songwriters that you think made you a better songwriter and that you would, you could share with, uh, someone like me, Sue, who writes songs? It's a good question. Um, honestly, I think you're always learning in life period. When there's somebody in the room who knows something you don't, the smartest thing you can do is shut up and listen. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I listen a lot, especially these days. I write with a lot of incredibly talented people. Um, I'm always trying to be the least talented person in any room that I'm in. So a, I know that something great is going to happen. And then also they always say, what, it, it's a very old saying. If you're the smartest person in a room, you're in the wrong room. Mm -hmm. It's a great philosophy to live by. And in music, you always want to be working with people that you just have nothing but mad respect for. So for me, if I'm working with an artist that, first off, if I'm working with an artist, it means I already have respect for this artist. I already, already love what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So that first thing is getting in the room and saying, okay, this is, this is going to be great. You know, there's, there's something, something's going to happen today. It's going to be awesome. Uh, the second thing is listening to them. What, 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 where are you in your life? What do you want to, what do you want to say right now? Because regardless of whether the listening audience loves a lyric or not, that lyric is probably based on something that's happening for real in that artist's life at the moment. Mm -hmm. So it's probably all based on this, this today, this actual day. Uh, there's an artist that I work with all the time named, her name is Carly Hansen and mm -hmm. she comes in and she's always got a story. So this is what happened to me the other day or, this is what I've been thinking about lately. And that inevitably is the song that we write that day. And the deeper the thought she's having, the, the deeper the song is going to be. So it, it, it comes down to listening and just being like, wow, you know, you're, you're really going through it. Uh, you, you reference Once You Want Me. Once You Want Me is a real story that actually happened. So Ian was dating a girl who lived in New York City. And he was flying back to New York to go see her all the time. And every time he got back, he just gets super nervous and he just couldn't wait to see her. And, and um, he was telling the story about how he was sitting up, you know, sweating in his room because he knew he was going to go see her. And he couldn't get there fast enough. He got into the cab and he tipped the driver right away, gave him an extra 20 bucks. He said, this is to get me there fast. Uh -huh. And so when we sat down to write the song, we just told Ian's story. And it's a real story. Maybe that's why it rings true, because um, it feels like it, it's a story that really could happen because it did happen. That's that. Uh, it sounds so deceptively sim simple, but it's it makes it makes total sense that it would be like that because that's like the the simplest the the greatest songs are like the most like direct and 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 honest coming from like a real a real. They place. are, and and it, you know depending on who you're writing with, I've been blessed to write with some great, really talented songwriters. Um, uh, some are artists, some are just uh, writers, some are producers. But if you're in a room with somebody who wants to tell the truth. You're gonna you're you're gonna come up with a great song, whether it's a hit or not. Yeah, who knows? But your goal shouldn't only be to write hit songs. Your goal should be to write great songs. So, like in that room alone, uh, Lindy Robbins and Sam Martin, the other two writers, mm -hmm. they they just they want to tell the truth, and they want to do it in a way where it's catchy as hell. So it's a blessing when you're in that kind of room. You're gonna do something great's gonna happen. Oh, absolutely. Um, question about the the music business because I, I I I research uh, I like reading about this kind of stuff. There there's this debate now with with streaming that that maybe uh, singles are the way to go versus albums nowadays. I was curious if you had any uh, an opinion on that. Yeah, and that's not necessarily based on the, the the music business as much as it's based on the audience, people that are listening to music. Uh, nobody has time for a full length record anymore unless you've been a fan of a band for for years and you love their catalog. We live in a we live in a moment that's very much like when the Beatles first came out, where people want to hear a song, and mm -hmm. they want to be they want to forget about life for three and three and a half minutes or two and a half minutes, however long the song is. And I think I think that's just because of where we are in the business. Singles are more important now to the business. But if you talk about the fans, mm -hmm. real music fans want a body of work, whether it's an EP, five songs, six songs, or whether it's a full length, ten, twelve. So I don't I think it's an it's an oversimplification to say that. The, the music business doesn't doesn't care about records anymore, uh, albums anymore. I don't think that's true. I think the listening fan base doesn't have time for full-length records anymore. 
but an artist's fan base, they have time. You know, they, they, they feel like they know the artist through their music. So the more they can get, the better. It's just a, it's just a difference in perspective. You think about social media right now, 30 second TikToks are selling more records than three minute songs, three minute spaces on the radio. So if that's the case and you can swipe up every five seconds and hear another song, how are you going to catch the listener if you're putting out 50, mi 50 minutes worth of music? Right. I think the business is responding to that. But as with anything, that's where we are right now. Will it stay this way? I don't think anybody really knows. I do know that if you're an important artist, people are always going to care about a body of work, period. That's just how it works. Great music brings great fans, brings full-length albums or, or, like I said, EPs. And, you know, if you're just writing pop songs, great. But then you're, you're, you're in the business of singles. Totally. Um, is there a, a record or an artist that you really enjoy that you think not enough people know about? Wow. I mean, there's the classics. Like one of my favorite American bands ever is this band that I don't know anybody. Every once in a while, I'll bump into somebody that bought a record by a band called Jellyfish. Mm -hmm. This was the early '90s when when uh, grunge took over, and it was mean and angry. And Jellyfish was just bright and shiny, like the Partridge Family, uh -huh. and they were amazing and they were incredible musicians. But they were just so freaking happy that nobody cared. And there's this tiny little segment of the society that still loves those records. So I'm, I'm I'm in that society. Me and my best friend uh, Kevin Kadish, we we talk about them all the time. We reference it all the time. This is. This is before you made music with a computer, so you actually had to play it. And those guys were incredible players, incredible players. Made amazing records, they sound great, and they still hold up. Uh, that's probably the, 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 the biggest travesty as far as, uh, you know, me as a fan listening back to music. But there's always great records that, that fall in deaf ears. I actually made a record, the thing that I'm still super proud of for a band called Satellite, way back in 2011, I think. Mm-hmm. And the other day I listened to it for the first time. I just, I had to, I, I was looking for snare drums and I wanted just an old, uh, like a, like a, maybe a, a black beauty snare drum. And so I had these samples that I had done on that record and I listened to them and I was like, Oh wow, this, this snare sounds great. So then I was like, well, let me listen to the song. And I listened to the song. I was like, man, what was I on this? This sounds, this sounds really fucking good. Um, <laughs> and, and yeah, nobody heard that record. That was another one. It just kind of fell through the cracks. Right. So there's 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 always one or two that you you wish people would discover, and then the longer people stick with it, uh, some of those great secrets eventually they just become, you know, mainstream. Yeah, my I I I know exactly what you mean. I've become over the past since I've discovered them like evangelical about this Japanese uh, pop punk band called the Winking Owl, that okay. I think are just the the great the greatest thing uh, the lead singer has she has this incredible voice and the lead guitarist it's 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 poppy it's all i wouldn't even know if i would call it pop punk in the like early 2000s sense but the guitarist does some um, really cool stuff i call it I, I i sort of describe it as paramore if uh if they were japanese and had uh, a different kind of lead guitar um okay so I, I, if there's one thing I could give to you, cause you've given me the gift of jellyfish, I would, I would want to give you the gift of the winking owl. Um, okay. I'm gonna check it out. Awesome. And yeah, they've got, uh, they've got a bunch of albums on Spotify and, and, and they've got videos. They're pretty, their stuff's pretty easy to find. Um, I have a couple more things and then I'll, I'll let you go. Cause I, I know you're, uh, I imagine you're, you're super busy with, uh, family and stuff, but I really appreciate, uh, the time, Mitch. Um, of course, brother. Uh, thank you, man. And, because your music has meant so much to me over, over the years and been a part of my life from the records and the show. So this, this is a, a really big day for me. And when my, my friend who I've mentioned several times listens to this, he's going to flip. <laughs> uh, What's his name? His name, his name is Chris McNamara. He's been my friend since we were in fifth grade. How you doing, Chris? <laughs> I appreciate, I, I appreciate that, that appreciate that, man. I, I think he's, he's going to dig that he's going to really dig that. Um, do you think, um, I know your career is now mostly in, in studio, but do you ever, even before this happened, do you still play live or do you think you would ever, uh, want to play live again in some capacity, even if it's limited? Well, I never say never, but, um, I don't have any plans to go play live. Uh, it's not that I don't enjoy it. It's not that, that, uh, people haven't asked. I think it's more, my my priorities about making myself happy just haven't included live shows in a very very long time 
Um, so I just, I don't think on that level, but I never say never. Excellent. And then one, and then, I, and then the last thing I, I want to ask you be, before I, I let you go, um, does, does calling my way to the middle exist in any capacity? And if so, <laughs> is it ever going to be released? And even if it isn't, can I still listen to it in some way? I actually finished half that record back in the day and, um, which is six songs. And I had written another three mm -hmm. that I had only demoed and I assumed it was going to be like a 10 song record. So I was one song away from, uh, finishing the, the, the writing aspect. And then I would have just had four more to finish. But the truth is, is I started giving those songs away, um, mm -hmm. sometime mid to late two thousands. Cause you know, I, I would take a meeting and somebody would say something and they'd be like, I'm looking for a song like this. And I'm like, wait a minute. I think I, I think I've got a song, uh, play and they're like, Oh, I love it. When can we cut it? So once my priority shifted from being an artist sure. to being a writer, I, I, I stopped looking at those songs and being so precious. That was probably the biggest thing I ever learned as a, as a songwriter. The difference between being an artist and being the writer is you don't have to sell it every night. Like the, like the artist has to. Um, and that goes for any of the artists that, you know, the, the, the biggest ones on the pop charts that maybe are doing songs that they didn't write, they still have to be the ones to sell it. It's not a hit if you can't sell that song. Right. So, like if you listen to some of the stuff that Ed Sheeran's done that he's given to other artists, I don't know that those songs are hits for Ed Sheeran, but I know that they're hits for Justin Bieber or, or uh, uh, Anne Marie. Actually, she's a, she's a writer on 2002, but um, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing for a songwriter to be able to say, I need you to the artist to come in here and make this song your own. Uh, if you have to rewrite it, rewrite it. If you got to sing it a different way, you know, but make it your own and then sell the shit out of it to your fans so that when your fans hear this, they react the way that, you know, we, we hope they react, which is it becomes, you know, part of their lexicon. It becomes part of their, their catalog that people can't live without. That's that's the ultimate goal, right? If you're if you're yeah. writing a song, you want people to hear that song, and you want it cut by an artist that can not just do it justice, but can do it better than you could ever do it. Yeah, that make that that makes total sense. You're 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 basically you're you're setting up the runway, and and they're piloting the plane, and then you're just watching the the plane take off. And yeah, I, th and I think most oh, I think most I, I can't speak for all songwriters and producers, but I think most of us realize that the value of an artist that is the vessel, you know, that, that is the conduit that this is where the audience is going to hear it from. They're not going to hear it from the writer. They're not going to hear it from even the producer, unless you're, you know, like a Dr. Dre or a Tim mm -hmm. Lillian or somebody, somebody at that level where it's, you know, you're, you're right there on the marquee of the song, but they're really going to hear it out of the artist's mouth and they need to believe every word. So you need that artist to be, you know, creative, uh, they need to be a writer. They need to be a performer. They need to be everything because they're the conduit of the art to the the listener. Without them, there's no music business. You could, <clears throat> excuse me, you could write a hundred of the best songs you've ever heard, but if you've got nobody to put them out, you're the only one that's gonna, ever going to hear them. Yeah. And con consequently, you could just be the bearer of ideas. You could come into the room with a great idea and somebody else could finish that idea and turn it into um, the hit that maybe it can become. You can't be so precious to to ever say to somebody, um, you know, you have to cut it just like this. You have to do it just like this. It's it's not about that. It's about what do you bring to this record? What do you bring into this piece of art? And can you elevate it? Can you make it better than I ever could? Which is kind of that's collaboration at its purest in, in in any way in any stretch of the the word. But um, I think filmmakers bring bring that kind of magic to to movies and. I think great songwriters bring that kind of magic to the to the to songs to great to the radio. Oh, to totally. That makes that makes perfect sense. That's uh, that's something I'm gonna I'm gonna try to remember that when I when I'm able to have uh, band practice again or when I sit down with my my guitar. I'm definitely, uh, and that's something that I I struggled with for a while of like you no, know, it has to be it has to be like this. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna remember that, Mitch. Thank you. <laughs> Well, think about think about Queen when you're writing a song. You know, everybody in that band wrote, everybody in that band sang, and some of the biggest hits that Queen had that Freddie Mercury sang, he didn't write. Mm -hmm. He didn't write "You're My Best Friend." Yeah, the bass player wrote that song. Uh huh. You listen to him sing it, and you're like, "How did he not write this? He's it's it's perfect. It's flawless. It's because Freddie's the vessel that delivered that message." But John Deacon, I think, wrote that song. 
Yeah. And and if there's if there's any better vessel to have someone deliver your song than Freddie Mercury, I don't know what it is. Yeah, that exactly. Ma- that makes you know? that makes total sense. Um this is and do you do you know if you have anything coming out uh soon or the or this year? Um it, everything's been kind of pushed around with um with uh coronavirus. Um mm-hmm. what is today? Today is today, the 19th? 19th, yes. I think I have something coming out this Friday on new music. Um I think I do. It, it, it yeah, everything is so up in the air and been been pushed around because of uh, because of um, the pandemic. Uh-huh. It's so it's such a weird thing to say, uh, pandemic. Yeah, you know, it, it 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 sounds way worse than I feel like right now where the country is, um, and I certainly don't want to uh, uh, scare anybody. But um, God, I just hope all this has passed us as soon as we can get past it. Obviously. Uh, it just feels like such a strange time for art. You know, how do we put art mm-hmm. out? How do we put songs out? Are people listening right now? I think that's probably the ma- most major concern for the businesses. Is, is anybody listening during all of this when there's so much to uh, think about with your safety and your family's safety? Is anybody listening to music right now? And I, 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 the answer I hope is yes. I hope people are, are taking solace in music because that's that's what it's here for. Oh yeah. I mean, I know for me, for me, the answer is definitely yes. Cause going back to what you were saying earlier, you know, uh, forget wanting to kind of escape from the realities of the, the, the world at the moment, uh, through, even if it's through a three minute pop song or, or yeah. just discovering that, that album I remember, or for, for me, like I've listened to, I went back and listened to every single Iron Maiden record. I'd never really listened to any of their stuff before. So, and finding new stuff, it takes me back to again that that kid I was when I was fourteen, and and I discovered, uh, and I discovered now you now you see inside, and that that kind of excitement and 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 giddiness that finding new stuff gives me is is what's carrying me through at least. And then being able to to have convers can really like connected kind of conversations like this is is it it, it has value, and I definitely think it has value now. So I think people are listening, man. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's amazing, man. You just put put SR seventy one in the same sentence as Iron Maiden. <laughs> <laughs> that I'll take it. Ab, ab, absolutely, Mitch. And thank you so much for for for, for talking to me, man. I've got a. I'll probably I'll let you know when I'm going to put this out. I, I've got to edit an episode I did with your former bassist uh, in Cinder Road frontman Mike Rocco. I've got a episode. Mike. It's Mike's sister who is married to the lead singer of All Time Low to Alex. Oh wow! Wow, that's such a crazy full full circle of all of my favorite bands from the Baltimore scene. This is that's gnarly, man. That's what I'm saying. It's like they they're they're kind of our brothers now. They can't they they married into the family. <laughs> that's that's great, man. Well, Mitch, this is this has been a dream come true for me. So thank you very much for for taking the time to talk to me. I I really appreciate it, man. And thanks for the years of uh, of great music. Well, man, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, you humble me. Uh, I'm uh, I'm still out there making music. I really appreciate you listening for, I guess, the last twenty years, huh? Yeah, those those three those three records mean a lot to me, and I, I've I've I still listen to them. I will, and I will always look forward to uh, to to seeing what what you what you write next, man. Well, I appreciate it, man, and um, we'll keep in touch. Absolutely, I I would love to someday send you something and and be able to say Mitch Allen gave me feedback on a song. <laughs> oh, well, it's not that big a deal, but I really appreciate it. Awesome, thank you so much, Mitch. I really appreciate it. All right, brother. You have a good day. You too, man. Stay safe. That was me talking to one of my all-time favorite uh, musicians uh, and creative people, Mitch Allen. There are times on this show that I simply have a hard time uh, believing the reality of, of the, the great conversations and the, the people whose uh, work has meant so much to me uh, over my life that I get to, to talk to on this podcast. And this is one of them. So Mitch, thank you so much for your time and uh, for your insights into the, to the craft of songwriting. I really enjoyed talking to you and, uh, and look forward to hearing uh, m- more new music from you in the future. So uh, 
Thank you guys again for listening to this. If you've never heard of me before and this is your first time listening to this podcast, thank you for taking a, a chance and listening to it. I sincerely appreciate that. If you enjoyed this and if you, or feel like you know somebody else who might enjoy listening to this podcast, I have over 150 episodes that you can enjoy. Uh, they're available wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. Uh, if you want to get a free month of Stitcher Premium, you can do so by going uh, to uh, stitcher.com slash premium and signing up with the promo code awesome. And uh, I also want to give a shout out to my supporter on Patreon at the awesome producer level, uh, Mary Beth Moody. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, if you guys want to check out uh, my Patreon, it's patreon.com slash awesome disaster. I recorded an entire five song EP in quarantine. You can hear it um, several months early if that uh, interests you. And uh, I can't imagine you're listening to this and you're not a big SR71 fan, but in case you are, uh, check out their check out their stuff. I think it, it means a lot to me, and I think that those songs really stand the test of time. So it was a great thrill to get to talk to uh, to Mitch Allen. Um, I'm just feeling really I'm just feeling really great uh, for for where I am at my life, and that I have had I have moments like this, even given the state of the world. So. Thanks for being here, guys. Um, I will see you next time between Awesome and Disaster. Stay safe, everybody.